The Bronze Bow, Chapter 2 Wait here, Daniel said to Joel. He strode down the path past Malthus. Go up and wait with your brother, he ordered, scarcely giving her a glance. Where have you been all day? Ebol greeted him. Rosh needs you. Rosh? Where? The man jerked his head toward the rocky hillside. Seven of us. There's a job to do. Even to Daniel's practiced eye, there was not a sign of life on the barren slope. Right now? Now. There's a pack train coming from Damascus with a string of slaves. They've almost reached the pass. Easy. No guard to speak of. All we're to take is one slave. No money? Not a thing but the slave. A black fellow. Big as an ox. Rosh spotted him yesterday when they stopped at Miron. Too good to waste on the galleys, Rosh says. Who are those two up there? A boy I used to know in the village and his sister. What are they doing on the mountain? They climbed up here for a holiday. The man snorted. <laughs> Get rid of them. There's no time to waste. Daniel climbed back up to where the two were still waiting. I can't go on with you, he said, ignoring the curiosity in both their faces. You'll be safe from here on, if you hurry. Joel didn't move. Is that one of Rosh's men, he demanded. Daniel did not answer. I know it is, said Joel, and there's something going on. His eager look scanned the hillside. Rosh is somewhere near here. I'm sure of it, and I want to see him. Please, Daniel, I may never have another chance. With the certainty that Rosh's eyes were on them, even at this moment, Daniel dared not delay. No, he almost shouted. Forget Rosh and go down the road as fast as you can. He was astonished at the anger that flashed in Joel's eyes. Who are you to order me around? Do what I tell you, Daniel insisted. There's going to be trouble any minute now. Excitement flared into Joel's face. Romans? No, you fool, not Romans. The boy's jaw had a stubborn set. You don't own this mountain and neither does Rosh. I'll go where I please. Two pairs of eyes stared hotly at each other. What about your sister? Daniel asked and watched the defiance blank out of the boy's face. Too bad, he thought briefly. He's the kind we need. There was a sound of running feet. A boy about twelve, thin as a scarecrow, came racing up the road, face crimson, eyes bugging. C coming, he stammered. They passed the dead oak tree. He scrambled up the steep bank of rock and vanished like a lizard into one of the jagged crevasses. Distinctly now, Daniel heard the first sound of an approaching caravan the groaning protest of the camels, the bump of heavy loads against the rocky sides of the pass, an occasional muttered order. Too late, he warned. Get up the bank, both of you, and out of sight. Joel whirled on his sister in sudden fear. Thace, you heard him. Get up there, quick, as far as you can. The girl lingered maddeningly. Joel, what? Hurry, Thace, I'll explain later. Then, with a snort of despair, Joel grasped her hand, jerked her toward the bank, and gave her a push. Up there, he repeated. Lie flat and keep your head down and don't make a sound no matter what happens. Daniel watched with approval. Once he had caught on, the boy had acted fast. The girl, too. She had gone up those rocks like a mountain goat. Then he saw that Joel had turned and was coming back. I'm staying with you, the boy said. There was no time to argue. Daniel grasped him by the arm and dragged him up the opposite bank. As they crouched behind a boulder, Ebol loomed beside him. He's all right, Daniel spoke quickly. I vouch for him. One sound from him, the man made one swift gesture. He won't, said Daniel. See to it then. Now mark this. Wait for the signal. The one in the yellow and purple is yours. No sport about it, Rosh says. No killing. He was gone as though he had melted into the rocky bank. In the still air, Joel's breath was loud. 
The boy's eyes fixed on Daniel's face were feverish. Daniel felt his own heart begin to pound. This was rosh for you, he wanted to say. You could never be sure what would happen next. Days on end with no excitement, and then all of a sudden, Rush would see something he needed or wanted, and like a hawk, he would pounce. Daniel began to feel the crawling in his stomach, half fear, half pleasure. Only recently had he been allowed a part. He wasn't used to it yet, especially the waiting. Joel nudged him. What do we do, he whispered. I do it, Daniel answered. You stay here. Joel's eyes sparkled. His young face was taut, his hands clenched so that the knuckles knobbed out. Daniel saw that he had no intention of staying there, and an elation he had never felt before leaped up in him. Suddenly, he grinned back at Joel, and in the instant, they heard a sound just below them. Close together, they edged their foreheads around the rock. The first of the train came into view, a burly guard armed with a heavy staff, and behind that, a second guard with a sword at his side, both walking silently, glancing uneasily at the rocky banks. They knew they were approaching a bad spot on the trade route, lonely, narrow, and treacherous. Above them, the boys waited, holding their breaths. The rest of the caravan wound slowly into sight. It was not much to brag about. Four manging camels, lurching grudgingly along the steep path, their burdens swaying. A string of unfed mules, one litter with dingy curtains, four ordinary tradesmen. With disgust, Daniel marked the one in purple and yellow headdress. The man was fat and out of breath and looked scared to death already. How long would it be before Rosh would give him a full-size job to do? Behind the tradesmen plotted the slaves, first the men, then a drab cluster of women herded close together, urged on by the flicking whips of two more guards on the rear. No question of which one Rosh wanted. Over the whole party towered one murderous-looking slave with lash-ridged shoulders and an ugly scar. What would Rosh want with such a brute, Daniel wondered. Still, it ought to be easy. Only eight men to account for. He caught Joel's eye and grinned again. Then both of them jumped to the shrill whistle. Instantly, the hillside erupted. Out of the corner of his eye, even as he moved, Daniel saw Rosh, always one jump ahead, hurling himself at the first guard. Accurate as hawks, other figures dropped to their chosen targets. It was too easy. The man in the striped headdress was fumbling for his danger when Daniel caught his arm, twisted it back, and seized the weapon from the fat, unresisting fingers, poked it against the roll of fat that covered the man's ribs. He stared down into the pudgy face, at the moist eyes blinking with terror, the cheeks gray with sweat, the fat lips trembling, and he felt cheated. There was no sport in a match like this, but he had his orders, and he held the knife steady. Around him there was a brief, efficient struggle, a few blows, some wailing shouts, the scream of a camel, all muffled in a spurt of choking dust. Then silence and the familiar hoarse bark of Rosh giving orders. The skirmish was over. He drew back his dagger and let go of the man's arm and stood back. Slowly, the caravan pulled itself together and moved on, grateful to escape with the loss of one slave. The tradesmen knew better than to argue. When they had straggled out of sight, Daniel took quick stock. One of Rosh's men lay on the path, his leg thrashing, another mopped blood from his arm. No one else appeared to be even winded. Joel stood rubbing his shoulder. Is that all there is to it? he demanded. Daniel strode across the path and pulled the cloak down from Joel's shoulder, revealing a bruise already darkening and swelling. Who gave you that? he demanded. Joel reddened. I meant to get the other arm of your man, he said, but his plagued mule. Daniel choked back a roar of laughter. At any rate, we got the slave, Joel added, looking ridiculously pleased with himself. The cause of the fracas stood motionless in the middle of the path. A giant of a man. 
naked except for a filthy loincloth, his black skin mottled with purplish bruises and patches of mud. Daniel, with an ironsmith eye, noted that the band's binding wrists and ankles were of double weight. The slave stood like a beast of stone, unaware that they had gone to this trouble to free him, indifferent that he had exchanged one master for another. Once again, Daniel doubted Rosh's choice. There was power there, all right. Those huge arms could crack the ribs of a man as easily as a child could snap a twig. But the broad face with the livid scar showed no sign of intelligence, only an animal wariness that would mark the time to strike. Then Daniel saw Rosh coming toward them. Rosh had a squat, thick body with a short, muscular neck and a grizzled head which seemed to thrust forward directly from the powerful shoulders. Now, under the bristling eyebrows, his small black eyes glittered at Joel, not with surprise because Rosh never allowed himself to be surprised, but with a hostility that made Daniel step forward and speak first. We've got a new recruit, Rosh, he said. Heavy legs braced, Ross measured the newcomer. Speak up, boy, he barked. Who are you? Rosh was used to seeing men cringe. Joel did not cringe, and though he was speechless, the pure hero worship that shone from his eyes must have melted even Rosh's suspicion. Joel Bar Hezron, sir, he managed finally. Your father know you're here? No, sir. In trouble in town, are you? Oh, no. Then what do you want with me? Joel stood his ground. I wanted to see you, he said because they say that someday you will drive the Romans out of Israel. When you do, I want to be with you. Rosh's teeth flashed from the midst of his matted black beard. As his gnarled hand came down on the injured shoulder, Daniel saw tears start in Joel's eyes, but the boy did not flinch. Well said, Rosh thundered. Any man who hates the Romans is welcome here. I didn't come to stay, Joel explained unhappily. I'd like to, but I can't, not now. I just came up here for a holiday and my sister is with me. And in a few days, we're moving to Capernaum. Rosh's approval twisted to anger. Not after what you've just seen, he said, his voice ugly. Now, you stay here. Daniel knew that Rosh was bluffing. Rosh had had a price on his head for too long to care now what news reached the village. But Joel could not know that, and Daniel felt a surge of pride at the steadiness in the boy's eyes. I'm taking my sister home, Joel answered. But if you mean I'd talk, you're wrong. If keeping silent is all I can do for now, then you can count on that. Rosh studied the boy. You're certain you want to work for me? I'm certain. You think you know how to keep your eyes open and your mouth shut? Yes. Then go along to Capernaum. There's time enough. When your turn comes, you'll hear from me. Rosh turned away. The matter settled. Suddenly, without warning, Daniel was shaken by a flood of jealousy. Not a word, not a look at him, who had captured the merchant and held him while they took the slave. What had Joel done besides getting in the way of the mule's hind legs? He wished again that he had never laid eyes on the boy. What do you think of him? Rosh was shouting to his men, waving a hand at the black slave. Worth a little trouble, eh? But the look of him, one man muttered. We're all like to wake up dead some morning. That's no joke, said another. He could crack two of our heads together like a pair of walnuts. Rosh only grinned. He walked up to the slave and clapped a hand on the trunk-like forearm. His own powerful body was dwarfed beside that of the prisoner. Don't look so glum, man, he roared. Don't you know when you're in luck? The slave stared down at him, uncomprehending. Do you understand me? Rosh questioned impatiently. Do you have a name? Not a flicker livened the stony features. There was some laughter. Samson, someone suggested. Goliath. Death may be one man guessed. Dumb too, I'll wager. Lots of those black ones are mutes. 
Ross shrugged. We'll see. We took him for his muscle, not his tongue. He'll prove his worth soon enough. If he ever learns which side he's fighting on, someone muttered. Rosh's good humor vanished. The joke had gone too far. I'll do the choosing, he roared. I don't ask for a vote by a pack of lily-livered jackals. Bring him along. He stamped scornfully up the trail without a backward look. The men eyed each other, each waiting for someone else to make a move. Then, without knowing what prompted him, Daniel stepped into the path. I'll take him, he said, reaching for the short length of chain that dangled from the iron wristband. Five of the men tripped over each other to follow their leader. Even the man who had lain writhing on the trail got hastily to his feet. Two reluctantly stood by, willing to reinforce Daniel from a distance. Daniel looked back at Joel. With the slave chain in his hand, he felt he had regained his former advantage. There was nothing to say now. The affair was over. Joel's eyes met his in a brief salute, and between the two boys something flashed, a wordless exchange that was both a farewell and a beginning. Though the slave plodded forward without urging, Daniel was forced to check his own pace when he realized how narrow a stride the iron shackles allowed. At the first turn in the trail, he looked back. Joel still stood in the path looking after them. Then he saw Malthus coming down the rocky bank in one sure fluid course, her dark hair falling about her shoulders. He remembered with sudden clearness what he had not even been aware of seeing up there in the mountain, the way that hair had sprung clean and alive and shining like a bird's wing back from the smooth forehead. He watched till the girl joined her brother. Then he set his face toward the mountain with his prisoner. He left the trail and struck off toward the right to follow a steep pitched course among the boulders. Once again, prompted by the sure grace of the girl, the thought of his own sister stirred in him like an old wound. Daniel already regretted the impulse that had prompted him to lead the slave. He knew well enough why he had done it. It had been nothing but a boast, an urge to make up for the fact that Joel had found favor with Rosh. He had plenty of chance now to curse his own childishness as he inched his way up the rocky course beside the chained ox. The two men who had stayed behind chafed at the slow pace, their crude jests about the prisoner soon changing to oaths at his lumbering progress. Once the sun dropped below the horizon, the dark came on swiftly, making their way even more difficult. It was like a release from a nightmare, to smell at last the fragrance of roasting meat, to hear the sound of voices, and to emerge at the familiar clearing. A roaring fire near the mouth of the cave lit up the circle of men sprawled on the hard dirt. The meal was almost over, and Daniel's two companions lost no time in flinging themselves down for their share. No one paid the slightest attention to the slave for whom they had a few hours earlier risked their necks. Daniel stood uncertainly, a chain in his hand. Rosh waved a greasy mutton bone in his direction. See that Samson gets his belly full, he shouted. After tonight, he works for it like the rest of us. A roar of laughter applauded him, but no one moved to carry out his command. Daniel perceived that, in his absence, the matter had been settled. Samson they had christened the slave, and Samson he would remain, no matter what his proper name might be. And Daniel had only himself to thank that he had been promoted to Samson's keeper. He went to the chilled depths of the cave where the goatskin water bags were kept, and after he had taken a long, deliberate draught for himself, he carried a gourd of water to the slave. The gourd contained only enough for two tremendous gulps, and he went back to fill it twice more. Then he brought a huge slab of mutton. The black man snatched it from his hands and sank his teeth into it with a ferocity that turned the boy's stomach. He tore off two chunks of barley bread and laid them down within the slave's reach. Then he went to the other side of the fire and sat down apart from the others. He had lost interest in his own supper. Rosh did not let him rest for long. 
What are you waiting for? The leader prodded him. Get your file to those chains. Tonight? Daniel was startled. Around the fire, the sprawling figures reared up in protest. Leave the shackles on him. He won't know the difference. He'll know right enough, and so will we when we get our heads smashed in. Shut your mouths, roared Rosh. What kind of patriots are you? We'll have no slaves on this mountain. He's one of us. Get that through your heads. I'll double the watch so you pigeon hearts can sleep. But the man sleeps free. With a sigh, Daniel got to his feet. This job would have fallen on him anyway, since he was trained to the trade of blacksmith. It was not the first time he had removed manacles. Two of the men, who now sat near the fire, had made their escape from the Roman mines. He went now to get the chisel and a mallet and a heavy file. The slave crouched in a sort of stupor after his meal. When Daniel signed to him to stretch out his arms, he blinked stupidly. Gradually, he seemed to comprehend what was required of him. He shifted his heavy frame and allowed Daniel to stretch the manacle wrist across a flat surface of rock. Then Daniel bent himself to the task that he knew would take half the night. Rosh stumbled to the pile of skins in the cave. Most of the men stretched out where they lay, pulling their cloaks over their heads and falling at once into slumber. The man who had first watch, planning to wake reinforcements before the slave was freed, settled down to observe Daniel's labor. From time to time, he renewed the fire so that Daniel could see to work. But beyond that, he had no intention of helping. Daniel's shoulders began to ache. The steady rasp of the file, which seemed to make little headway on the double thickness of metal, wore his nerves thin instead. After an indeterminable time, a narrow channel sank almost through the first band. The slave did not move. The guard, bored, prowled about the fire, poking in the ashes for scraps from the meal. To keep himself awake, Daniel began to talk, expecting and getting no response. I know this is hard on you, he said, but it's no joke for me either. Rosh was right about the chains, but if he'd had to do the job himself, I wager it could have waited till morning. Still, what Rosh says goes, and you might as well learn that tonight. The black eyes in the half-darkness look like bits of polished basalt. You don't know what's happened, do you? Daniel asked. You've got Rosh to thank that you're not on the way to the galleys. If you don't know what the galleys are either, I suppose, but you do know the taste of a whip. That's plain. Well, that is over. It's not easy here in the cave, but there are no chains and no whips. You're safe now. The slave gave no sign that he either heard or understood. But Daniel went on, thinking out loud, shutting out the grating of the file with the sound of his own voice. Rosh is the finest leader you could ask for. He pretends to be careless, but actually he leaves nothing to chance, not the slightest trifle. He has eyes in the back of his head. That's why he's been successful. And his band is growing while other bands break apart or get captured. And he's afraid of nothing on earth, nothing. He laughs at the Romans. There are more coming to join us every day. Someday there'll be enough. Rosh asks of them all just one thing. They must hate the Romans and be willing to go on fighting till the last cursed one of them is driven from the land and Israel is free. We live only for that, and so will you. Rosh knows he's not taking much of a chance with you. Any man who has worn these things on his wrists will die before he will have them on again. Do you know what I'm saying, Samson? I can see you don't, but soon I'll show you something you can understand. The fire had died down to a flicker, and the night was far gone when the last of the four iron bands had worn thin. Daniel whistled to the guard, who jumped nervously to wake two comrades. The three stood watching, swords in hand. Daniel picked up chisel and mallet. The bands fell with a clatter that woke half the camp. Then he stood back. 
The slave still knelt, looking down on his hands, not moving. Finally, Daniel bent toward him, touched his shoulder. The heavy man shifted, heaved up, and reared over Daniel. For an instant, Daniel knew a shaft of real fear as the massive arms slowly reached, stretched to their appalling length, and the chest expanded in a deep breath. Then suddenly, in one incredibly swift motion, the man went down on his knees, and before Daniel could move, he had seized the boy's foot in his huge hands and bent to laying his forehead against it. Daniel jerked his foot away. Get up, he snapped. It is Rosh who freed you. When the slave did not move, he turned and walked away. That's done, he said, trying to hide from the guards his quivering embarrassment. I could sleep for a week. He located his sheepskin cloak, wrapped it around him, and lay down just outside the circle of firelight. Samson came crawling toward him and haunched at his feet. Exasperated, he got up again, rummaged in the cave for another tattered cloak, came back and flung it over the naked shoulders and lay down again. Then he pulled his own cloak over his head and slept. He was too tired to ever wonder why he was not afraid.